the United States of America is facing a retirement crisis. And no, it's not because the Social Security Trust Fund will be completely empty in less than nine years. And no, it's not because pension funds have been gorging themselves on high risk investments. And no, it's not because people have been under investing in their own retirement accounts for decades. And it's not even because people have been choosing terrible investments inside of their own retirement accounts. It's because all of those things are happening at the exact same time. Time, which means most Americans alive today will never be able to retire. But the good news is that as long as you know what it takes to get there and then you actually do what it takes to get there, you can. And if you follow the very straightforward path that I'm gonna lay out for you at the end of this video, you'll be able to avoid this retirement crisis and set yourself up and your family to be financially secure. When I graduated college, I was completely flat broke like most people. I had about $200 in my checking account. My job at the time, I was getting paid about $4 per hour and I had about $30,000 in debt. So negative net worth, no money, no income. And I had this lofty goal to someday become financially free. I just didn't know how I was going to get there. And so I thought the best way to do that was to get inside the finance industry and learn from the people who were actually doing it. So I became a stockbroker. Now, throughout my time as a broker, I learned a lot. I made a ton of mistakes and lost a lot of money, but I also learned how to make a lot more money as well. During my first couple of years, I worked primarily with low net worth clients. And then during my final couple of years, I worked primarily with higher net worth clients. And specifically regarding clients who were retirement age, there were basically two groups of people. One group of retirees was poor and dependent, and the other group of retirees was rich and dependable. Now, the main difference between these two groups of retirees through my interactions with hundreds, if not thousands of them, and looking at their income and their financial habits and their plans and their needs and hearing their stories, I noticed really one main difference between these two groups. Those who had a large nest egg and who were prepared for retirement, they had consistently for decades planned and acted as if someday they would be responsible for taking care of themselves and for taking care of others. Whereas the group that was poor and completely dependent on others or on the system had spent their entire lives consuming everything they produced. And they just hoped that someday somebody else would be there to take care of them. Now, I never wanted to be in that group. And I don't think most people ever see themselves someday being in that group. But the reality is it is difficult to choose to sacrifice what you want right now for something that you want most later on. And that's actually why we have a retirement crisis today, starting with social security, because the very promise of social security is that you can live your entire life in blissful ignorance, live in the moment, never plan for the future. And someday when you're old and you have nothing left and you're not producing anything anymore and you have nothing saved because you've consumed everything and then some, somebody else will bear the cost of supporting you. And unfortunately for everybody who has believed that lie, that's about to come to an end because the Social Security Trust Fund will be completely depleted by the year 2033. That's in less than nine years. Now, with many economic predictions of doom and gloom and projections into the future, it seems like they just keep on getting farther away into the future and they never actually arrive. But specifically with Social Security, this trend has actually been accelerating. That drop dead data of when the Social Security Trust Fund will be empty has been getting nearer and nearer. In fact, take a look at this report from the Social Security Administration themselves that was published back in 2010. At that time, they knew the Social Security Trust Fund was going to run out and they thought that it wouldn't run out until 2037. But every year, that date at which the trust fund would be empty has been getting closer and closer because the amount of money leaving the fund has been greater than what has been going into the fund. One of the driving factors of this is that the number of workers who are contributing to the Social Security Trust Fund is declining as a percent of the number of people who are getting paid out from it. Now, when this trust fund hits zero, that doesn't mean that Social Security paychecks immediately hit zero. What it means is that we have two options on how to move forward. The first option is the default in which the paychecks to Social Security recipients would be reduced by 25%. Essentially, the amount of money getting paid out in Social 
Security would have to exactly equal the amount of money coming in, which means that beneficiaries would receive a 25% cut. Obviously, that would be extremely politically unpopular. And so they may have to change some laws or jump through some legal loopholes in order to get to option number two, which is the government would borrow extra money to spend the difference. Now, if they do go with option number two, this means that the amount of money in circulation will be increasing as a result of keeping the social security paychecks the same. And as we know, when you print money in order to pay out to individuals, that drives up prices, which means that no matter which option we're looking at, option number one or option number two, social security beneficiaries are going to receive a pay cut either way. They're either going to be receiving fewer total dollars or they'll get the same number of dollars, but those dollars would just have less total purchasing power. But either way, it's a cut. Now for younger people today, uh, there's a widespread belief that social security is something that we should not even think about, not even something that we should remotely imagine we could depend on. But unfortunately, that hasn't translated into people taking more responsibility and using their 401ks or their own retirement accounts to make up the difference. If we take a look at data by Empower, which is a 401k provider, we can see the average 401k balances range from 74,000 in the age range of 20s up to a high of 555,000 in the age range of the 60s. Now, for those of you who are not aware, averages can be skewed when you have somebody with a large amount in the group. For instance, let's say we have 100 people in a room and 99 of them have $1, but the last person has a million dollars. To get the average, you would take the total number of dollars in that room, which is $1,099,000, and divide that by 100 people, and you would see that the average wealth in that room was $10,099, which is obviously very different than the vast majority of people who only have $1. It's just being skewed by the one person with a million. And so these average numbers of the 401k balances are going to be skewed to the top side by some individuals who have exponentially more. This means that the median numbers are going to be far more accurate because the median just lines everybody up and takes the middle person and sees what they have, which is gonna give you a more accurate representation of what the average person actually has. And we can see that these numbers are even worse with the median balance for people in their 20s at 29,000, topping out at a median balance of 247,000 for people in their 50s. And we have this data from more 401k providers than just Empower. If we take a look at Vanguard's data, we can see that under 25 has a measly median balance of 1,900 $148 in their 401k. And even the top balance is a median of only $71,000 for the age range of 55 to 64. For those that are literally about to enter into retirement age, they don't even have enough in their retirement accounts to last one year in retirement. And the data from Fidelity is very similar with the 20s age range having an average balance of 10,500 and the top age range of 60 to 69 having $182,000. That's average, I couldn't find the median and we know that the median will be a little bit lower at least. Now, this situation is not unsalvageable for most of these age ranges. Most of the demographics, if they contribute enough, we've got enough time to let that compounding interest work to have enough in retirement. Unfortunately, that's not what's happening with Americans actually pulling money out of their 401ks. At Bank of America, who has more than 4 million planned participants, they saw a 36% increase in hardship withdrawals during the second quarter of 2022. And in the last five years, these hardship withdrawals have actually tripled at Fidelity. And Vanguard reported that theirs have doubled in the last four years. Essentially, instead of Americans continuing to load up their future with saved money that can grow for them to take care of them when they're older, they're taking from it right now, interrupting that compounding interest so they can consume it right now. And as if that wasn't bad enough, in order to do this, you have to pay taxes on that money and penalties for taking it out early. This means that if you need 10 grand to cover an emergency expense today, you might actually have to take up to $16,000 out of your 401k just to end up with a net $10,000. And that money never goes back in. It doesn't keep on growing for you. It's done growing for you forever. Now, all that sounds pretty bad, but the icing on the cake for 401ks is the way that people are investing these accounts more and more recently. Over the decade from 2013 to 2023, plan participants 
participants at Vanguard moved out of equity funds into target date funds. Equity funds moved from an allocation of 34% down to a recent 26%, whereas the target date funds moved from 34% up to 63%. Over the years of 2013 through 2022, we saw a decrease in investors allocating to equity funds from 44% in equity funds down to 38% in equity funds. Over that same time period, target date funds moved from an allocation of 19% up to 40%. Now you'll probably notice that if you look at the totals on the top of that chart, that equities totaled 71% in 2013 and we're still around 72% in 2022. They really didn't change. And that's because target date funds are funds that are specifically designed to change as you age, which means when you're still younger, they have more of an exposure to stocks. And then as you grow older, they sell the stocks portion and go more into bonds. And so while the current allocation is still about 72% equities, which hasn't really changed since 2013, as each of those planned participants continue to get older, those allocations go more and more into fixed income. And if you think that's not a problem, just hang on until we get to the next section when we talk about why fixed income investments are such a problem going into the next few decades. Now, just in case you're thinking it'd be better if people had retirement accounts where they couldn't control the investments, in other words, pension funds, well, you'd be wrong because pension funds are actually doing the exact same thing. And while pension funds are currently overfunded, they have been doing the exact same thing with the investments moving out of equities into fixed income. Now, the first reason why overexposure to fixed income in retirement accounts is a problem is because of leverage. Because as long as you can hold a bond until maturity, you are very likely to get paid back your principal plus interest. But if you have to liquidate ahead of time, chances are you'll actually have to sell it at a loss. Now, that's exactly what happened to pension funds across the pond when the gilt market almost collapsed in 2022. They were forced to sell their portfolio at far below face value. And this was triggered by rising yields. We'll come back to that in a moment. For over a hundred years, we've seen a long-term debt cycle play out in the United States of America that takes about 40 years for each phase of the cycle to complete. The last complete phase of the cycle lasted from 1980 through 2020, which saw a period of time in which bond yields continued to drop while inflation also continued to drop. The phase before that lasted another 40 years from about 1940 through 1980 when the opposite happened with inflation and interest rates both moving higher. So we see this trend where inflation and interest rates will move lower and then higher and then lower and then higher. And each of these phases lasts at least a couple of decades. There's nothing magical about 40 years. It could be more, it could be less, but these are long-term cycles. One of the main drivers of this is the debt to GDP ratio. We can see in about 1945, the US debt to GDP ratio peaked at around 120%. And then the United States government started to deleverage from there. It was an inflationary deleveraging. And for the next couple of decades, the debt to GDP ratio decreased, which was the same period of time in which interest rates and inflation were moving higher. The debt to GDP ratio bottomed at around 30% in 1980 and then spent the next 40 years moving higher until it peaked around 120% again at the same time as the next phase of the cycle bottomed in 2020, which means we are moving into a new phase of this long-term debt cycle in which inflation and interest rates both move higher for a long period of time as the United States government deleverages through inflation. They have too much debt to pay the debt off directly. And so they have to print money to cover their expenses. This means inflation and interest rates move higher for everybody else, but at least for the government, it makes their funding easier because they're printing money to spend. You get a deleveraging through inflation for the government with a rising inflation and interest rate cycle for the rest of us. This means that long-term fixed income investments are going to be terrible for investors for a while. Long-term fixed rate debt is not the place you want to be when interest rates and inflation are moving up. Number one, the value of your bonds will go down as the interest rates of new bonds go higher. Number two, the interest rate you're getting paid will not keep up with the rate of inflation, which means you are losing purchasing power. In a rising interest rate environment, the only debt you wanna have is short-term debt. And in a falling interest rate environment, the only debt you wanna have is long-term debt. Now, I know the demographics on my channel 
and most of you are not at the age yet where it's too late to start saving for retirement, which is good because most of you are still in that demographics where you have enough time to prepare, but you've also had enough experience under your belt where you're in a high income earning mode now. So here's the plan, exactly what you're going to do so that you can make sure for certain that you will have enough someday to not only take care of yourself, but to also take care of others. The first thing you're going to do is you're gonna figure out what is the amount of money you need to live on every single year. Consider a couple things first before I come up with the number of, you know, 100,000. Consider that number one, in 10 or 20 years, 30 years from now, prices will be higher. So you're probably gonna to have to overestimate a little bit. So if you're thinking $100,000, maybe bump that up to $150,000. Also consider that when you stop working, most people actually end up spending more money in retirement because you have more free time, more leisure time, you're going to visit family, you're traveling, you're doing things, and also your medical expenses go up. So for those reasons, for this number, your annual retirement number, you should probably overestimate a tad bit. Step number two, you're gonna divide that number by 4%. So if you need $150,000 a year to retire, you're gonna divide that by 0 0.04 and you're gonna come up with $3.75 million. The reason why we're dividing by 4% is because that's a good rule of thumb for how much money you can take out of your nest egg without it affecting the overall balance for the long term. Theoretically, you can draw 4% out of it forever without ever depleting your nest egg. Essentially, you're taking a little bit less than the annual growth rate. Okay, so if you need $150,000 every year, that means you need roughly $3.75 million in order to retire. So how do we plan on what we need to do to actually get there if you're not there yet? You're going to go to a compounding interest calculator. You can find these online. This one is moneychimp.com, but you can use any of them. First, you're going to plug in the amount of money that you currently have. So we'll start off with a hypothetical 150,000. And then you're gonna to have to play around with the numbers here. We're going to assume an 8% growth rate and say that you have 25 years left to let your money compound for you. If you put in $1,000 a month into your total investment portfolio, that's $12,000 a year, that will net you $1.9 million in 25 years. Now, that's not enough. It's good, but as we've seen, if you want to be able to pull 150 grand a year at the safe 4%, you're gonna need about 3.7 million. So how do we get this number to 3.7 million? Well, we either have to just wait longer, change the number of years that we're gonna let it grow. We don't wanna mess with the expected growth rate because then we are banking on something to happen that historically is less common. And so we have to change the annual addition. So what if we do $2,000 every month, which would be $24,000 a year? We're closer at $2.9 million. Let's up this to $36,000 a year, which is three grand a month. And finally we got there, $3.8 million. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, well, that just made me even more depressed because there's no way I can come up with an extra three grand every month just to be able to invest for the future, don't worry, I've got you there too. In my final year as a stockbroker, I was making about $250,000 a year and I had a plan to stick with that job and take my extra money and invest it in order to be able to become completely financially free and retire someday. And I did not like how long that plan was going to take. To be honest, it's because I was miserable and I hated that job and I couldn't see myself sitting in that job for another year, let alone another 15 to 20 years. At the time, I had a few skills that I had learned from being a stockbroker. Number one, I knew how to invest. Number two, I knew how the financial system worked. Number three, I knew how to communicate with people. And number four, I knew how to sell. I thought those skills packaged up were enough to start a successful business. And so I quit my job as a stockbroker and I started Heresy Financial. That was June of 2019. I quickly learned that those skills by themselves were not enough to make any money. And I spent the next six months making zero dollars. And it took me a total of a year and a half before I made enough money to even cover all of my bills. And I was only able to start making money because I had to pair those original four skills with additional skills. In my case, it was videography, video editing, graphic design, design and marketing. Those eight skills packaged up together were the skill stack that I needed in order to start making way more money than I had ever made in the past, which is your step one. You need a skill stack that can make you money outside of your job. Your job may have given you some skills that you need, 
What you're likely to find is when you employ those to start a side hustle or to quit your job and start something else that you can make a lot more money, you're gonna realize there are some other skills that you need to learn to stack on top of that so that you can explode your income. Pretty much universally, some of those skills are going to be marketing, communication, sales, and media. And it's almost a certainty that you are going to have to start a side hustle or a business that you'll be able to quit your job and go all in on if you want to make enough money to be able to invest enough to produce a large nest egg for yourself in the future. The reason why we have a retirement crisis today is because most people ignored the fact that they were making just enough to survive and were not putting enough away for the future. Which means if you wanna get a result that is different than what most people have gotten, you have to do something different than what most people have done. So learn your money making skill stack, which is gonna be some skills from your trade and you pair that with sales, marketing, communication, media, hiring, content. That's gonna scale your income from your side hustle. You can either take all that income and invest it or you can go all in on your side hustle, make that your main hustle and scale that income even more. And then once you have sufficient income to do the three grand a month or five grand a month or 10 grand a month, whatever it is that you need to get to where you want to go, then you're going to invest it and you need to invest it properly. In my opinion, the 60-40 portfolio is dead. Modern portfolio theory is not the way to go. That is data that has been pulled from the last phase of the debt cycle. And what worked in the last phase is different than what works in the next phase, which will be more similar to the phase that lasted from the 40s through the 80s. A much older, more time-tested portfolio approach is about a third in stocks for that capital appreciation, about a third in real estate for that cash flow and the tax benefits, and then about a third in reserves, which is not just cash, it's you know savings instruments like gold, Bitcoin, T-bills, money market funds, some cash, so that you have some dry powder to buy assets when they're on sale and to last through the tough times. Making sure your portfolio is uncorrelated, hedged, and you're making small asymmetric bets. And most of all, you are investing a large amount of income consistently for a long period of time. You're going to be able to produce enough to not only take care of yourself, but to take care of others who you are responsible for. And in my opinion, this is the end goal. This is the reason why we do what we do. It is to give and to take care of others. The antidote to greed is not to despise wealth. It is generosity. The person who said money cannot buy happiness just hasn't given away enough yet. And by the way, if you want more of everything that we just discussed and you want exact detailed steps, training material on how to do and how to understand literally everything we've discussed in this video. I have all of that plus a lot more in Heresy Financial University. It's a membership program, coaching program, where you go through and you learn how to do all of this stuff. We've got group coaching calls where you have access to ask me questions literally every single month. We've got a community where you can discuss strategies and investments with other members of Heresy Financial University and many more features and benefits coming along soon. If you're not already a member, sign up with the link in the description below. As always, Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.